Okay, okay. So, hello everyone. This is um, a live streaming um, about a little bit about my work, but mostly also about um, my recent uh, uh, actions uh, for the past year and a half. I've been um, uh, doing um, some actions with some groups like Extinction Rebellion or End the Gelender. Uh, so that's why I, I sort of wanted to share some of the experience and also share about some of the, the equipment I'm using and um, maybe hopefully inspire some people to use uh, technology in general uh, for climate action. Uh, so uh, to start, I'm just going to do like a very brief introduction of a project I've been working on for the past uh, few years. Um, so I guess you'll be able to see the connection between, uh, between the work and, and the actions I've, I've been doing. Uh, it's very much connected. So this project is called Blueprint. Uh, it was shown at the Stripe uh, Biennale um, a few years ago. And it was uh, commissioned by uh, Angelique Spanix and production by Juliette Bibas. And we had um, a big challenge. Uh, we had uh, sort of limited resources, but we wanted to do something very immersive. So I had to do a lot of research to actually find uh, very bright projectors, but very compact. And uh, with help from uh, Elliot Woods, we sort of found this way of, um, he found this way of hacking a projector to sort of remove the color wheels. So you could take any regular projector, very small and uh, pretty cheap projectors, and you could um, modify it to be able to do much larger projections. Uh, and I guess all the research and development I do in my work, uh, I can also now use it in the, the climate action uh, projects. Uh, so that's, I guess, the first connection. If the, all, all the R&D, all the research I do uh, can be very useful for, uh, for other things. Uh, so here you can see it in motion. So the piece was uh, about uh, geometry, architecture and the cosmos. So it was a sort of uh, abstract journey through geometry and then the end was um, the, about the connections we can find in, uh, between the architecture and the structure of the universe in general. So I won't really go into details regarding the projects, uh, but you'll see a little later how this sort of relates to, um, uh, to the projection I do in the field. I've been doing a lot of projection mapping over the years. Uh, this was a project about 10 years ago in uh, South Korea. I was with uh, my uh, uh, label and collective Anti VJ. So we were traveling a lot at the time and like doing projects all around the world with very big projectors. And I, with those projects, I sort of learned how to um, technically how to project very precisely onto buildings, onto canvases, and, uh, and the projection mapping skills uh, now can be also uh, useful, not just for shows or festivals, uh, but I guess anyone who's sort of creative and who develops a, a sort of toolkits and, and skills, um, I, I now realize with, with these recent actions that all these skills can be very useful for not just for entertainment or web projects, but also outside of this. Um, so, and I guess in the near future, the world is changing so much that we might have, uh, we, we will really need a lot of those skills to, uh, um, for, for other things that just work and, and clients and projects. Uh, this is a different technique. I love projecting in space and uh, not just on a flat screen, but also on, um, transparent materials onto the, here. This is a. A water screen, so the screen itself is in, so almost invisible. You can feel there's a texture, but uh, it's a very interesting canvas because the interaction between the body and the projection could be very interesting. You sort of break the idea of a screen and you realize you could project in, in space and in need air. Uh, so these are, are the projects I've been working on for the past years. Uh, this piece is called Constellation. Uh, it's our, I guess, most successful project to date. Uh, it's a big projection on a big water screen that we show in public spaces. And um, it's, yeah, it's been like years of, of research and I'm really happy uh, that this, this project is now, was actually the, the one project that helped settling the, the studio. Uh, we're now based in Brussels. I work with Juliette Bibas who runs the studio with me. And uh, this one project, really helped us developing a lot and also um, uh, touring and uh, until everything was cancelled. 
So now all the, the, the dates we had and the gigs we had with Constellations are all uh, postponed in the best case. Uh, but uh, as for everyone, we, we don't really know um, uh, when the next show will be and um, it's all very vague. Uh, so actually it's a good time to, uh, to start traveling around the world. Actually about uh, six months ago we've decided uh, to stop flying. So it's been a big shift in our practice already. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in trains and it's really not convenient. I wouldn't say it's hard to stop flying. It's actually uh, a luxury to be able to fly and to be able to travel so much. So uh, it's, it's just inconvenient. So, um, so yeah, we have to, to, to change a lot of things in the way we work, in the way we approach uh, the projects and the future, etc. Um, so this, uh, yeah, I don't know yet what, what the next thing will be. Um, I guess a short introduction to, to transition from, um, uh, from my work into uh, the coal mine, which, will, uh, which I'll discuss in a minute. Over the past years, as well as doing projection on unusual surfaces, I also started doing a lot of work about uh, nature, about the big deserts, the big landscapes. I have this fascination for uh, empty, desertic, post-apocalyptic landscapes. And I did, um, last year, I did this uh, six weeks road trip, or I call it a four weeks road trip in the southwest of the US. And I focused on taking um, pictures of these amazing landscapes and I also had this little robot and I would, um, this is weird, having a, a double, double myself. Uh, so yeah, a lot of exploration in nature. I've realized that this subject of the big landscapes is called the sublime. It's, uh, it's nothing new, of course, it's been explored by artists forever and uh, very much, it was very much explored in the 18th and 19th century by the German Romantic painters and they were amazed by the beauty of light, the beauty of nature, the beauty of these huge landscapes. So I have this obsession with huge <laughs> mountains, huge craters, huge volcanoes and the sort of, uh, this picture shows it well, how, how small you feel when you are uh, faced, when you are facing those places. This is the Rodan crater, the most amazing and insp inspiring place I've, I've I had the chance to, to go to lately. Um, so yeah, that's it for the, for, for the sort of recent work. Um, and now I'm gonna uh, talk about something completely different. I'm gonna talk about the um, Ambar coal mine. Uh, it's, uh, it's a location uh, not actually very far from Brussels. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the largest coal mine uh, in Europe. And it's right here. It's actually a, a, about two hours drive from Amsterdam, one and a half hour drive from Brussels. And um, this place is just, is just incredible. Um, I'll just show you some of the uh, footage I've been... So yeah, this is the, this is the mine uh, seen from, um, from on Google Earth from space. Uh, so I've, when I heard about this place, I couldn't really believe it was so close to Brussels and I couldn't really understand the scale of it and uh, it was just very weird that I've never heard of this place. So I uh, rented a car and I uh, drove there to actually see it by myself. Uh, I also took uh, my drone with me so I could uh, shoot some pictures and images and I thought it would be just a, a regular visit like I do a lot of uh, side visits and I like uh, I go to a lot of places, that's one of my uh, favorite things uh, to do. So this is one of the first images I did and when I got hit there and I was really amazed about the scale, as I said, in the, in the backdrop here you can see uh, the coal plants. Uh, so the coal mine is about seven kilometers long and six kilometers wide and the coal um, is extracted and then it's been sent directly by train um, there, there are train tracks from the mine to the, those power plants that you can see in the background. They are, here you can see three of them and there's a fourth one uh, behind, behind me, behind the camera. Um, and to be honest, it was, it was really striking. I was really amazed. I found it uh, quite beautiful. I shot some drone images and I really loved the colors and the gray gradients and the fog and the machines themselves are really, really 
impressive. Uh, they are the largest machines on Earth. Uh, they are 200 meters long, 100 meter high. This is just incredible. You can see here for the reference, you can see a car here and you could see like a smaller bagger here. Um, but yeah, I was, I was very amazed. I was really impressed. Um, and, uh, and I was, I started being a little bit obsessed about, uh, about the place. So I, uh, when I first went there, I spent, uh, two days, I think, to shoot images and I came back to Brussels, but I couldn't really stop thinking about this, uh, this area. Um, I, so I started doing some research to try and to understand, uh, its impact and it's sort of try to grasp, to get an idea of, of, of this location to understand it. Um, so the forest you see here on the lower half of the image is the forest of Anbach. And it actually it used to be 90% um, uh, larger, but uh, it's been cut down uh, to expand the mine. And what you see here, here is only the 10% the, the uh, that remains. Uh, the forest is about 12,000 years old, and it's also um, the home of uh, 140 species of biodiversity. And it's been cut uh, since the, the late 70s, I think. So the coal mine has, has been uh, in activity for a long time. And some people uh, are actually trying to save the forest. Uh, so you, um, you can see here like a tree house and uh, they are currently um, um, between 30 and 80 people uh, living in the, in the trees and they're actually there to sort of protect uh, the trees and to uh, prevent the trees from being cut. So it was a bit surprising to to, to learn about this story and I've uh, met some people uh, from the, the tree houses and we had a lot of conversations about their, uh, why they're doing this and, uh, and, and I later realized that this particular place uh, is, is a very strong symbol. It's the sort of uh, the front line of the, the sort of battle of uh, capitalism versus nature. Uh, because Germany doesn't need coal anymore. It's actually more expensive than renewables and it's, not, it's no longer profitable, um, but it only exists because of subsidies and because of, of uh, lobbying uh, from the, the, the coal companies. Um, so it's the sort of the fight of the rich uh, CEOs of companies versus um, environmentalists and, and people who are sort of trying to, 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 to stop the, um, the destruction of the, of the forest. Uh, as I said, it's the largest source of CO2 emissions in Europe. Uh, so it's, it's just a statistic. Uh, but I was so amazed by the number that I did this very basic animation that shows it's actually the real-time emissions. So it's three tons per second. And what you see here is what's being emitted as we speak. And it is what it will continue to be emitted for the next uh, 19 years. Uh, the mine should be, um, the mine is set to close in 2038, I think. Uh, the German government announced uh, earlier last year. But at, until then, uh, the, the, the baggers are extracting um, uh, the coal and the coal plants that we see here are burning the coal right away to produce electricity. Uh, so, again, as I said, I was very... Um, I started being really obsessed by this place. Uh, how come we, we allow this to happen? Because when I think about my own uh, impact, uh, you know, I've, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm doing my best uh, to uh, reduce my emissions. So I stopped tr uh, flying and I think that saves about two tons for a long um, courier flight. And I try to eat local and I try to uh, st stop eating meat. And, you know, I do my, my best efforts to, uh, to make a difference. But after visiting this place, I, I, I realized that this is uh, pointless. This is actually so insignificant that um, it, it, it's all really uh, bullshit to think that I can make a difference with my own uh, personal consumption. Uh, and it's, it's a very difficult um, thing to process uh, that even by doing my best, I'm, no, none of us are going to change the world if we don't start tackling these issues of the big emitters and the big polluters. Um, so, 
So yeah, the obsession carried on. I kept going to the mine uh, every two or three months uh, with the drone. I started meeting people. I started learning more stories, sort of side stories. Um, there were actually 22 villages have been raised in the past um, uh, years, and there are four more villages that are said to be erased and destroyed. Uh, churches are being raised as well because there's coal to, uh, to get underneath. So basically, um, uh, you can say that the, the heritage and people's lives and people's homes, they don't have much value compared to, to the coal that we do not need uh, because it's, it's too expensive to extract. So once you start being obsessed by those, then you really start questioning yourself about the, 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 the values, um, the things we should do, the things we should stand for, the things we should protect. Uh, and I think uh, discovering this place and learning all these stories really struck me so much that it had a very strong impact on, on my life. Uh, so the, the footage you just saw is from uh, Arne Musselner. He's um, a German videographer and a German photographer. And he's been doing amazing uh, work. And this is a drone image I took of the same um, church that you saw before. So this was my third trip, and by the third trip, I was getting very emotional. Um, I'm not a Christian, I don't go to the, to the church, but I do a lot of projection onto architecture and onto churches, and I'm very sort of sensitive to the history of stones, the history of, um, of villages, and when I see a church or a cathedral, I think about uh, people who built it 100 years ago or, or, or more, but in this case, Imerat was built in 1891. And it's all being cut, it's all being destroyed just uh, for coal extraction. And uh, it's, just, it's just so moving and so, um, so, so strange. So this is the drone image from uh, Arne, and this is uh, my drone image that I tried to sort of calibrate. And to be honest, at this point, I started being really emotionally challenged. Um, I went to um, this, uh, the, the deconsecration of Mannheim. This is a, a church uh, near the mine. The whole village now that you can see around has been completely erased. Only the church um, stands. And this was the last mass. And I remember um, uh, hearing uh, uh, people attending the mass crying because there were uh, people who used to live in this village and their village has been raised, their homes have been taken, uh, they've been expropriated and now they're attending the last mass of the church where they were married and um, where maybe they had their parents' funeral and stuff. So I, I started being like really moved and I, I really started reconsidering, um, you know, values and things in life because it's, uh, it's fun to be a jet setter and to be in, uh, in planes and to do projections in festivals. But just outside my home, uh, just uh, two hours uh, outside where I live, there's an ecological disaster and, and social disaster and injustice, and I've just never heard of it. So it did start to be a real obsession of mine. And it's also so beautiful when you look at the scale of things, there's a sense of beauty. There's a sense of terror when you see the, the, the church being erased. But I wanted to focus as an artist on these elements of beauty and, and, and the sublime, I guess, that you can, um, you can see here. It's called the technologically sublime. It's the, how, how with technology, with coal plants and with things that can uh, damage the earth, there's still a sense of grandeur. So it has become a, a, a subject in my work, but also I started being a, a radical activist because when I saw so much injustice, I really want to do something. And I had no idea what, but I, I tried stuff. Um, this is another picture from, uh, from an article in uh, Bloomberg. It shows the scale of the machine. Uh, it's, I found it really, uh, really incredible. Uh, these machines are 100 meter tall. You can actually, in the coal, in the coal mine, you can fit the entire uh, island of Manhattan. And even the Empire State Building, it won't stick out of the mine because it's 400 meters deep. So the scale is just incredible. So I did a lot of Google research to understand who's funding it. So it's uh, the usual sus suspects, um, BNP Paribas, Deutsche Bank, uh, BlackRock is also the investor that um, uh, allows the mine to happen. And guess what? Who's providing the software for it? 
Uh, it's our dear friend Autodesk. I was very surprised. I, uh, I actually like Autodesk products. They do um, a lot of cool stuff. They do 3D Studio Max, Maya. Uh, they, I use Fusion 360 for 3D printing, laser cutting. Uh, and I, I'm, I have to say it's part of my community because I've, uh, I've met a lot of people who work at Autodesk, a lot of friends have been doing re um, uh, residencies at Pier 9 in San Francisco. I visited Pier 9 myself um, with Juliette, we had a chance to, uh, uh, to, to go there and to see all these machines. Employees are really nice, people are really sort of progressive and they do a lot of uh, PR around uh, uh, gre how green the company is. So I was very surprised and I did um, uh, a tweet to the CEO, um, he's very active on Twitter, his name is Andrew Anagnost. So I sort of contacted him and um, started this, this conversation to, uh, to ask him, but so if you're so green, why do you keep providing software? And uh, it was just a disaster. The, the guy just didn't understand any of the, of the issues. Uh, it just said that, um, uh, basically he says, oh, it's not possible to, uh, to police people who use the software and uh, blah, blah, blah. So it was all very, uh, very weak response. And the next day he actually went, uh, uh, he actually asked his staff to remove the PDF and the cold case study from his website. Uh, just to make it disappear and he was hoping that the, the, the whole story disappear. So I was really upset. Um, I was still, I, I still had in mind the cries of, uh, of, of people attending the last mass in their church. I was uh, thinking about the trees being cut, about the CO2 emissions. Uh, so I had a look at uh, Autodesk policies and Autodesk policies is very clear. They are supposed to identify and measure the impacts of their operation on products. It's all, it's all over the website, um, so this is what they claim and when you sort of challenge them um, with these questions, they just delete the evidence and they pretend it, it, it doesn't matter. So uh, after insisting so much, I had a, a call with the CEO of the um, uh, foundation, uh, which was interesting. She was sort of genuinely concerned and she said, one month after um, I contacted Autodesk, she said um, she never heard about the coal mining stuff and we should have a meeting and then she, uh, we had this call and then she cancelled the next meeting. So anyway, it's a very long story, it's a bit boring, I'm a bit pissed off because now they are uh, censoring every post I can do, I, I, I do on um, forums. So uh, I'm sort of blacklisted uh, from their um, uh, servers as well. If I send an email at autodesk.com, it's being filtered, so no one received them. And I was so pissed off that I decided to go to uh, Autodesk um, um, office in Montreal. Uh, I was there, I was in Montreal for um, Mutec Festival. It was very interesting. Uh, actually, a lot of people from our community um, Alex from Creative Apps was there, a lot of friends from, from Brussels were there and we, I handed the flyers um, of, uh, of a link linking to my pictures to the employees. So at least the employees, if they don't get my emails, they could maybe learn about this, the, the, this story. And I had a couple of nice conversations with uh, employees and we did this pop-up show. So the idea here was to go like super low tech and like bring the pictures and bring the work and that shows the impact of Autodesk softwares to the employees and to the, 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 the people of Autodesk. Uh, it was a very nice afternoon. It was, uh, as I said, quite creative. We couldn't really attach the strings to the wall because it's a private property. So we had to sort of hang some strings to bikes and someone had to stand for like an hour, uh, you could see here. So it was fun. Um, it didn't bring much change because the, the, the people inside, the, the executives actually called the police and said they didn't want to speak to us, uh, but the employees were nice. And actually a couple of days after, I received some emails from employees saying that they were interested. Uh, again, like very long story short, uh, I went also to the London uh, office to do the same thing. Uh, again, they didn't want to speak. Uh, so this was about, um, how long ago, like a year ago, and I still haven't had any feedback or any news. So, uh, I decided to, uh, to make a website. I, I used to be a web developer 
So I, I can do uh, I can do HTML and CSS and JavaScript and you know that kind of stuff. So I sort of gathered all the the, the, the drone footage I've done and I've created um, this very simple web page. I'm I'm really glad the, the domain name was still available. Uh, you can check it's Autodesk.earth and it's. Uh, it's basically the collection of one year of sort of research and filming and statistics. And so if you have a minute, you can have a look. Um, it's uh, first, it shows the, the numbers I've already uh, shown you. Then you can see the, uh, the website um, and the, the, the PDF that is on the autodesk.com um, server. So you can see here how proud they are uh, of this success story and um, so okay some people could argue argue uh, so yeah Autodesk is not responsible and uh, it's none of their business but actually I think it is I think uh, Autodesk does licensing to companies so if they flag a client that doesn't comply to their policies uh, they could just add this client to what they call uh, their denial list so they have a denial list. It's a tool they use on a daily basis. Uh, they just put clients on this list and they're being excluded from doing business with them. So if they were including coal, oil, gas and fossil fuel companies to their denial list, um, even if it's not enforced at the end, at least it would be a signal of hope. It would be showing that uh, Autodesk is not supporting uh, coal mining. Uh, but yeah. At the moment, what they do is they try to hide um, the evidence and uh, it's a really, I found it really, really um, uh, sad and, and devastating that they're not taking this very seriously. Again, like this is the, the single largest source of CO2 emissions in Europe. Uh, it's just, if, if everyone, uh, if all the citizens uh, reduce their CO2 emissions by, uh, let's say, 80%, you quit flying, you quit uh, meat, you buy local, it would still make zero difference when you, when you look at the, the, the emissions from this mine. So that's why, personally, I want to start focusing on, uh, on the big uh, emissions. Uh, so yeah, anyway, if you have time, have a look uh, at, uh, at, at this website. Um, there's a lot of information. If you are interested in sharing it, uh, that would be very great to have support from the, the, the sort of tech uh, community. Uh, and, um, and yeah, also I need a bit of uh, help to, uh, to do some uh, micro, uh, I, I call it micro pressure. The idea is to target the CEO of Autodesk and a few other executives just to re-amplify the message. Uh, so it's, just not, it's not just me, the weird French guy who's obsessed, but also I think if uh, more people were showing some, um, some, some interest and like amplifying the message, that would be a, that would be a, a great thing. Um, so this, one, this was one approach, uh, how to use HTML and CSS for uh, climate justice and climate action. I don't know how, imp how much impact this will have, but um, I'm hoping we will have a, a response for, uh, fr from, from Autodesk in the next few days. Um, I'm actually using Autodesk tools to uh, 3D scan um, the, f the forest and also the villages that are being destroyed. And I'm working on an audiovisual project uh, using Autodesk tools. So there's a bit of weird twist here. Of course, their tools can be, can be really useful and amazing, but also I think um, they can be devastating and, and very bad. Uh, so that's it for Autodesk. Maybe we'll come back to it later if you have questions, but I want to also uh, talk about how we can use projection and light in general, uh, which is more my, spe my specialty, uh, in order to, uh, to bring awareness about the, the, the envir environmental challenges. Uh, so here's a projection I did on the, um, on the church of Mannheim, the one that will be d destroyed uh, in the next weeks, in the next months, hopefully not. But, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you how it started. Um, oops. Um, okay, so first, what kind of action can we do around the mine? Um, of course, a lot of people are already doing things around the mine. And there's a group uh, called Endo Gelende, 
they are really, really uh, inspiring and in incredible. It's one of the sort of um, new movements that have been um, appearing over the past uh, five, six years. Uh, you, you probably all know by Extinction Rebellion, Friday for Future, and Endergelander has been really active uh, in, in Germany, and they actually do uh, uh, actions around the mine and around the power plants. So I, wa I was there last June, and I uh, again, I used my drone and the, the sort of technology I'm uh, fluent with to sort of support their actions. Um, this was a really incredible moment. Uh, as I said, I w I, I'm very pissed off about um, about what's going on in, in the coal mine, but also uh, against myself for not being aware of the of the the, the coal issue we have in in Germany and in, in Europe, and like finding other peoples and finding groups to uh, to work with um, was just incredible. So this was one of the most uh, striking days of my life, I guess. This was the 1st of June for my birthday. I was with them on the, on the train tracks and in the coal mine to, uh, to, to sort of um, uh, film and, and document this. Uh, the next action was supposed to be uh, at the end of September, I think September 21st or something. There's a chance that things might change, but uh, if you are interesting in, interested in direct action and civil disobedience, uh, I really recommend um, uh, joining under Galendo or Extension Rebellion because this gives a lot of hope. I think it's a, a great uh, resource for creative ideas and, and for projects in general. And uh, at the end of the day, I brought my laser into the mine. And it was just a small thing, but uh, when everyone was sort of cornered in the mine by the police, I was up in the mine and I, uh, I use my very compact laser to project and the Gelende. I'm not sure if you can hear anything. Uh, so RWE is the company running the mine. So when I, when I projected fuck RWE, which really isn't, I'm, I'm usually very polite, but um, I could see uh, 1,500 activists cornered in the mine and being taken away by um, uh, mobile prisons. Uh, I, I, yeah, it, it was such an astonishing moment that uh, I had uh, my laptop and VVVV and I could live te uh, write text live and project down into the mine, which was, I think that was four, five hundred meters away. Uh, but the laser is so, uh, is so strong that you can actually project from any distance. So I think laser projections can be a very uh, strong creative uh, tool to, uh, to, to sort of amplify a message or spread a message. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, to thank Juliette uh, Bibas. Uh, we work together, as I said earlier, and she's doing the, uh, the, the live links uh, in, in Facebook uh, and she will be also taking questions and, and uh, sending them to me. Uh, so yeah, laser projector. If, if you're interested in like specific links and I have this sort of secret PDF that I did for um, groups such as Extinction Rebellion or Friday for Future, so it's about four years of research um, of software, hardware, batteries, etc. Um, and this is something I can share. If you are, uh, if you work within um, within uh, one of these groups, feel free to get in touch, and I'm happy to share and to sort of spread also the knowledge of uh, like basic uh, um, suggestion for the for the lenses to use for the strategies. Um, so yeah, this is the size of the laser projector. As you can see, it's very uh, tiny. You can fit it in a backpack. And what you see just there is a, is a battery. Uh, and it, you can run the projection for about an hour and a half. And I have a slightly larger battery that also fits in a backpack and you, you can project for four hours. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity here to, do, uh, to plan projections uh, for live events or live TV or you, or, you know, be very strategic to find a, a spot when you want to, to project a message. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of tests, doing a lot of work with Extension Rebellion lately. 
uh, because Endo Gelendo is only in Germany and uh, Extinction Rebellion, um, I work with them in Brussels, but also I met a lot of them in Montreal and I did uh, the, the rebellion in, uh, in London as well. Um, so I'm going to skip through the R&D quickly because it's, it, it's a long process again. So this is the most compact projector uh, you could find. You can, you can print uh, the images with a printer. So it's very convenient and you could have, it, it's a, it costs about 100 euros. Uh, you could even make your own projector with a DSLR lens. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, um, of opportunity here for super compact uh, uh, projection system. This is about the size of the projection you can do. So it's not amazing, but you could do like three meter wide uh, uh, projection. This was before I, I met with Extension Rebellion, so I was um, uh, by myself at night going to the European Parliament to test some projections and to sort of understand the, the limits. This was very blurry at the beginning, so uh, after doing this, I realized that um, uh, you can't put so much text, uh, obviously, so you have to be very careful with the focus and with the content. Uh, but I still, anyway, I started doing this series uh, on the facade of BNP Paribas. Uh, so it's, uh, BNP is also funding the mine. Uh, so I started uh, going at night outside the, the bank, taking pictures, and then the next day tweeting to uh, the, the CEO and uh, the executives. And that didn't have a huge action, but at least I've, uh, I've learned some numbers. <laughs> I've, uh, I've realized that uh, BNP Paribas invested almost 4 billion euros uh, in coal uh, since the Paris Agreement. So they're basically uh, continuing uh, all investments, um, so they're not doing any effort. Um, so I started doing different locations, I started doing um, different types of content and I learned a lot until the, the event uh, in London with Extension Rebellion where I had a much brighter uh, projector. Uh, this is actually, you could see the projector on the left, uh, it's, it's not so heavy, you could have it in your backpack and it's like 8 kilos I think and it's uh, 30,000 lumens. So with this projector, you could do a 30 meter wide image. So this is the British Parliament. Uh, you can also see a colored projection here, uh, which was also made by a 30,000 lumens projector. But a regular um, DLP projector that was set up in a room in a hotel uh, secretly. Uh, my friends from uh, Bristol, uh, um, they are actually called uh, Projection Rebellion and they managed to, to, uh, to get a projector, get a, a hotel room and to set up everything. And I'm really glad they were here on that night because I turned up from the Eurostar. I decided in, a, in the afternoon to join the rebellion and because I was so uh, frustrated to be in Brussels. So I took my stuff and I ran to the Euro Eurostar and I arrived on this bridge. It was very rainy. Uh, it was very... Um, uh, one of the bridges had already been uh, evacuated by the police. There were still uh, seven other locations, but this one bridge was uh, being taken by the police. So it was a little bit sad for me to, to arrive and it was raining and it was all very, uh, very, very sad, I think, with like uh, people from Extinction Rebellion with flags and um, it was us battling against uh, an invisible uh, enemy. Uh, called capitalism or, or whatever. So anyway, my friends from Projection Rebellion uh, called me and said, oh, we're in the hotel, we're going to start the projection in five minutes, get ready. And then I got motivated again and got my projector on the shoulder and uh, started the battery and then everyone cheered up and it was a very, a very strong moment. Uh, you know, very small action, very sort of tiny thing. Uh, there were about 500 people on, on the bridge and I think I had more feedback and emotions than uh, a lot of the uh, sort of projects I do in festivals and things. So there's this sort of emotional connection that is interesting. Um, so I decided to do more and more of these projections. So the next day, uh, we did a couple of places and I was very tired. Uh, let's see if I can get rid of this now. Uh, yeah, very tired, but um, I bumped into my friend Ben Templeton. 
And he was very, uh, he was very uh, cheerful and excited. And he said, oh, let's do Buckingham Palace. And uh, I wasn't planning on doing so because, uh, you know, the, the, you don't want to disturb the Queen. And, uh, and also, she, uh, you, you would expect a lot of um, security and police. And you can actually see them here running uh, towards me. So anyway, my friend Ben says, yeah, let's go to Buckingham Palace. We get there, we sort of organize, um, a, in, in one minute we organize a strategy of like setting up the projector, setting up the camera, and then we do this. We turn on the projector, uh, we are five, uh, 400 meters away from Buckingham Palace, but still we manage to get a very big uh, Extinction Rebellion sign uh, for about one minute before uh, the Secret Service is starting, started uh, uh, running towards us, uh, and then we shut down everything, um, and then we shoot off to, um, to the other side of the park. So they, we were too fast, so the security couldn't stop us. And we had this uh, nice picture and uh, some nice footage, and it was um, in the news uh, the next day. Uh, so again, like a very small, very tiny uh, action, but um, it was a great way to sort of amplify uh, Extinction Rebellion's message. Um, on building. So I think there's a, an opportunity here. Um, so, okay, keep in mind that this is my first talk about uh, climate action. So if it gets a bit uh, all over the place, uh, bear with me. Uh, so this is the Royal Rebellion in Brussels. Uh, really exciting actions. I'm sorry, th those pictures are not actually from me. Uh, and some, for some reason, the, the credits don't show up. Uh, all of them, but these are um, some of the best photographers in, in, in Brussels. Um, okay, so the police response was absolutely catastrophic. They were very, um, the police was very uh, violent and uh, this was a very bad signal from the, the power and from the state and from the government. Uh, for like peaceful activists, uh, children were gazed and uh, you know, as soon as you start doing activism, you realize how tough the world is. Uh, I, I say this uh, as I laugh a little bit, but, uh, you know, uh, as a, a privileged white uh, uh, person, I, I, I sort of use it's It's easy to get disconnected from the real world and, you know, to spend um, a lot of time in... Um, in, uh, in, in technology and VR and projection. It's, it's all nice and shiny, but we should really uh, uh, realize that there are a lot of social uh, injustice in the world, a lot of things we don't necessarily have access to, and the climate emergency is going to um, uh, um, make those problems explode even more. And all the challenges um, with capitalism, I guess, will, will make this more obvious. But I think, for me, the call of mine was a wake-up call, and climate action now um, feels like a very important part of my life. Um, so. It's hard to, I'm a visual artist. I usually use visuals, not words. That's why I, I struggle a bit. Uh, but anyway, at the end of the Royal Rebellion, uh, a lot of uh, activists were taken to prison. Um, and I had a small chance, a short chance to do a projection on the, the King's Palace. Uh, again, it's symbolic. Not many people saw it. Um, uh, for real, but um, it was, uh, I think, Projection can be a great tool to amplify uh, messages. Okay, so Juliette sent me a, a question, so I'm gonna um, uh, stop the, the long monologue and, uh, and do a bit of interaction. So it's a question from Sasha Unufriev, uh, who's asking, what advice would you give to people who keep finding themselves working for clients with questionable ethos who have to keep putting food on their family's plates? Uh, that's a tough one. I obviously don't have a question that will uh, work for everyone. Uh, I'm happy to work as, a, as an artist and not as a designer. So I don't work for clients. I uh, produce works and pieces and, and, and projects and then um, uh, festivals and there's a lot of public funding um, so uh, I, I'm very lucky to be in, in, uh, in, in Europe uh, with a lot of pen public funding for the arts, and this is my main uh, income, I guess. So I don't have to, uh, to work for clients and to work for uh, oil companies or car companies. 
We are often being approached with Juliette to do uh, commercial works and when it's uh, oil or gas or uh, fossil fuels, I, I really am um, very aggressive. I may, I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but uh, I try to lecture people and that's weird um, because I sometimes drive a car and I used to, to go in planes. So, it, so, so yeah, but for people who don't have the choice, I, I, I think it's difficult. I, I think I would try to, uh, you know, as soon as you, you, you do your own work and you work very hard to make it stand out, then you, you sort of um, earn your freedom uh, because you can do your own stuff. You don't have to please a client. Uh, so early in my career, I said uh, no to, um, to, 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 to clients uh, and to projects uh, for cars or for brands, but it was a, a luxury for me because I, was so many, uh, I had too many inquiries. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, but right now, if someone had to, I, I think I would, I would have very strong ethics. I would refuse uh, um, projects for gas, oil, or you, I mean, you you draw the line and you decide your own threshold. But I would I would have very strong uh, values, and I would communicate about th those values, and I would then uh, try to prioritize uh, greener projects and better projects. And I think this would sort of balance itself. But as soon as, if you don't have ethics, if you start doing projects with every company, then it's a lost cause, I think. You end up, it, it's, um, I, I think you need ethics and you need to be clear uh, and it's not easy. Um, so, yeah, Juliette is giving me so, some advice. Um, so, let's say you are employed at uh, Facebook or Google or Autodesk and um, and I think generally those developers and those people are doing great work. I don't think they are responsible of the behaviors of the CEOs. Um, and uh, but but I think that there's an imp important opportunity here for the, those um, uh, employees to put some pressure on the CEOs to to actually uh, apply their policies, enforce their policies, and and do greener projects and do more ethical projects. I think there's a, a, a lot of focus on these GAFAs and on, on these tech companies. And uh, the medias especially, they are very much focused on the dissonance voices from the empl employees. You, we've seen a lot of uh, actions from uh, um, Amazon employees, um, uh, Google employees who, st who did this project called uh, agreenergoogle.com. Uh, so people who are at working with Extinction Rebellion and working at Google, it's possible to have this sort of double um, uh, hat. Uh, so yeah, I think if you work in tech companies, if you're in the tech industry and if you are sort of privileged enough to be able to choose your project and if you have a voice uh, on social media, online and with clients, I think now is a, probably a good time to sort of stand for stronger ethical uh, values, uh, I would say. I'm going to skip through, I'm going to do real quickly, oh no, okay, I'm going to take another question. Um, so Thiago Pires and Benjamin Cooley asked, how can we, video, uh, video mapping artists, join forces and ideas to fl fight on the climate crisis? Um, so I think now, with these weird times of, uh, of uh, confinement and corona, the, 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 the previous world is collapsing. Uh, the oil has a negative price and everything is changing. So I think it's a good time for, uh, for a shift, for a change. Um, I would say that um, it's time to, to change our perspective on the world. You know, about a year ago, I wasn't the radical activist I am now. Uh, I was... I had a, a mindset, I had beliefs that sort of prevented me from doing any action, anything at all. Um, I was actually so privileged enough to travel and to do conferences and, and uh, this was like, it's, it's a great life and it's a bit uh, selfish. I wasn't really interested in political questions and I wasn't doing any actions because I generally believe that um, leaders and governments and CEOs and people in charge were actually doing uh, enough to keep us safe. 
you know, it's, it sounds a bit cliche, but, you know, Paris agreements, blah, blah, blah. Even if it's not applied, at least there are people working on it. And maybe in 2050, change will be there. And uh, so that was my belief, like leaders are doing their work. But when I, I discovered the, 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 the coal mine and the fact that the CEOs, uh, so Andrew Anagnost, the, the CEO of Autodesk, um, he, he doesn't want to divest from fossil fuels. All the communication on his website says so, but he doesn't want to because it's very profitable for him. I think he makes uh, $750,000 a month. He makes $9 million a year. So he doesn't want this privilege to be taken away. Um, I think he doesn't want to earn eight or seven or six millions because he can get nine millions um, by working with uh, coal mines, oil and gas. Uh, so he's not going to change anything and he's going to do everything he can to uh, hide this problem under the carpet and not take actions. And basically, I don't, I don't care about Autodesk, it's, but it just shows how there's no hope in our leaders, uh, you know, our governments, they're not even, um, they, they put themselves in this situation where they can't even find masks for hospitals. They can't source a piece of tissue with uh, strings. That's how bad they are. So we can't ask them to solve the, the climate crisis. We can't ask, ask them to divest from fossil fuels. This is not going to happen. If we rely on the leaders, we are dead. Like Australia is going to be burn down uh, uh, even more next year and the year after and in five years and floodings are going to intensify in, in the UK. Um, the Brazil, Brazilian, the Amazon uh, forest is going to keep burning and keep being cut. Um, you know, we're living in a terrible world and the end of our world is coming. You know, I wasn't really into uh, collapsology or, you know, this idea that the, the world is collapsing because I wasn't looking hard enough. Uh, Every scientist, every evidence shows us that this is the end of our world. We can't sustain, so we have to take actions. So it's not that uh, video artists uh, could get together. Uh, I think the basic point is we have to do something. It might not save much, but we have to try if we want to, to keep this planet livable for another decade even maybe. Uh, so yeah, I don't know how we can get together, but we have to, we have to do something. That, that's my belief, of course. Who am I? I just woke up like a year ago and now I'm, I'm like an activist and I'm telling everyone like, do something. I should have done stuff uh, a bit before. Uh, so bear with me if I'm a little um, uh, uh, aggressive with, uh, with Autodesk CEOs and with, with capitalism, I think is the, the, the root problem. And I'm going to take another uh, question. Um, so how can we contribute to the climate change movement and how, what are the other ways we can use these skills? So I don't know. I have no idea and I'm trying everything I can. So I can do uh, drone footage, I can do projection, I can do laser stuff, I can do creative coding, HTML and CSS. In the real world, now that the world is shut down, this is useless. Like I can't get food. I can't get any water. I can't, you can, I, I, I cannot live with the skills I have. I cannot source uh, edible food uh, um, if the system collapses. So my skills are a little bit useless. And I see a lot of people in our field are feeling the same. So uh, you, of course I can use, uh, I can use Maya and I can use amazing tools, but this is useless for the real world. Like making an app for a VR headset is not going to bring food to your family and it's not going to keep, uh, um, um, you know, what I, what I mean. So now I think it's a time to look at the skills we have and try anything and try everything. So we have to be creative. We have to find those ways. Uh, one way we found with Juliette. Uh, so we, we live and work together and we did this great residency um, in uh, Iceland a couple of uh, last uh, summer. And we realized that we want to create imaginaries. We want to think, imagine a future that would be um, uh, 
uh, better than the, the, the full technology world. So we did this project where we planted uh, trees and we were drawing uh, a future that would be more interesting. So, you know, as creative people, I think we can find ideas and imagine a version of the future that we would love and that we... Uh, as soon as you imagine a, a positive future and you um, uh, share it, then it may exist uh, if you don't imagine, it will never exist because uh, it has to be it has to be made up somehow. So I think as artists, we should uh, make up imaginaries and create uh, more positive visions uh, of the world. I think to uh, aim for. Um, okay, so the second part of the question was da, 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 sorry, the messenger is. So apart from laser and video projection, how do we join forces? So yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I started a, a newsletter, like a, a, a virtual newsletter. I've sent one email yet, but it's uh, I share about the, the, the climate action I do. Uh, so maybe join this newsletter. It's uh, maybe Juliette can paste the, the link. So I don't know what to do. We should do, uh, we should talk about it. If you have ideas, please send them over. Uh, we could join existing forces like Extinction Rebellion and the Gelender. We could take our equipment and, and join them so we could amplify their message. Uh, so another question from Camilla Colombo is, are you in contact with civil society organizations that have already established relationship with the UE, UE Parliament or the European Commission? If not, would you be up to start a conversation with these such structures? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I will be very direct. Um, I was not interested in politics before. I thought it was a uh, little bit boring and useless. Um, and then one thing struck me in the past years, uh, one, struck, one thing struck me very much. It was, the, it was when uh, Nicolas Hulot, the French um, uh, 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 ecological uh, sort of not not just activist, but uh, uh, he, he was uh, he, he was in the government, and then he, he resigned because even uh, being in a minister, he can't do anything because the government is uh, the the power is uh, uh, me, like government no longer have uh, a power. So I lost face in governments, but at the same time, that's what sort of triggered me. Uh, to do something. So I think uh, there's a trade-off here that we shouldn't uh, expect anything from any European Commission or anything. I'm still up for conversations, of course, but I, I, I think we shouldn't wait much from uh, leaderships and governments and structures like this. I think it's... Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to... You know, politics is not my thing, so I'd rather do direct action and art but uh, I don't think, yeah, uh, I don't think there's much hope in the current uh, government and structures. Okay, so question collective. Many people ask how can they have access to the R&D PDF you mentioned. Uh, okay, so this PDF is, uh, is very uh, valuable for me because it's, the, um, it's all, all, yeah, all, all the work I've done over the, pa the past years. So, I'd rather share it with organizations and people who are active. Uh, so if you did some actions in the past, please uh, contact me and uh, describe maybe your actions. And, uh, and then we can talk and we, we, we could uh, exchange it, these, these elements together. What I don't want is to make this public and to see um, brands or agencies using this uh, for you know, commercial projects. That would be such a failure. Uh, also, because the future will be filled with those projections, I think um, uh, Gobo projections, uh, laser. So, so the longer we can delay um, uh, agencies from accessing these equipment, the better it, it may be. Um, okay, so Juliette is sending another question. I'm gonna drink a beer real quick. Okay, so. You said you don't believe in politicians, so you just believe in teaming up with collective like Endo Gelende and XR. Uh, yes, that's my belief. Of course, I'm not. I can't. 
I don't have the truth and I might be wrong and maybe the hope will come from uh, UE uh, and I hope it will. But my belief and what sort of enabled me to take actions um, is this understanding. There's, there was this great uh, podcast from Timothy Morton um, on the BBC a couple of months ago. It's called The End of the World Has Already Happened. And there's a psychologist uh, in this um, uh, podcast and she said that we often have, there's, there's a syndrome called the rescue fantasy. The rescue fantasy is what personally uh, kept me inactive for my entire life. It was this idea that uh, the world will, would solve itself out. Uh, so I could just do my, work, my projects and travel and work. I would just do my life uh, as a sort of privileged person. And the world would sort itself. And maybe governments and technologies would solve the problems. Uh, the UE would solve the problems. The policies would solve the problems. The CEO would solve the problems. Uh, and, and actually... Uh, this is bullshit. No one is so. Uh, no leader is taking significant action to save us. We have to be the change that we're waiting for. Uh, we have to to start taking actions. So I think it's my belief that politics were useful that kept me from doing any action. And now that I know that we're fucked if we don't take actions with Endergalende and XR and Friday for Future. If we don't do stuff, we're dead. This is my belief. Um, again, I hope I'm wrong and I hope politics can be useful sometime. But to be, honest, to be honest, I'm really deceived and I wouldn't put any hope in any political uh, change. I don't know anything about politics, um, I must say. But, uh, uh, and, and my perspective is probably biased and I, I, I hope young people would keep, um, will keep doing politics, uh, maybe. But um, I mean, the, I say the classic terms of politics. I think we need a, 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 a new system of politics. What Extinction Rebellion suggests is the citizen assemblies. Uh, is that instead of um, voting for one president uh, that will stay for, for five or seven years, uh, and you, you just give the power to the citizen assemblies. So it's people randomly selected that will gather together and take collective actions uh, for the, for the uh, not just for the few, uh, the few, not just for the lobbies. So I believe in a kind of politic that is not um, uh, the current ones, but that it's more towards uh, uh, the citizens assembly. And I think we need civil disobedience to, to sort of push civil um, citizen assemblies, sorry. Okay, one more question. So I still work with NGOs sometime. I've been working with NGOs um, uh, who are really active within the coal mining. Um, let me, I'll try to put like, what else do I have? Um, yeah, I don't think I'll, I'll find some. Juliette is asking me to, to put some uh, action footage, but uh, no, I'm struggling. Uh, so yeah, I do work with um, official journalists, uh, with journalists, with NGOs. Uh, I've been in touch with uh, people from Greenpeace. Uh, people from uh, 350.org, uh, there are a lot of uh, journalists and activists with, which uh, I think are doing a great work and that are bringing uh, uh, a lot of hope, I think. Um, so maybe we'll see if there's another question from Juliet's side. Okay, so Alex, uh, Alexander Schultz is asking, how can or should curators and cultural producers respond to the climate crisis? Anything you, as an artist who have been traveling the, first, the festival circuit for more than a decade, would like to see change in terms of producing events? So that, 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 that's a, a tough question. To be, to be clear with you guys, I'm new to activism. Uh, I don't hold much... Uh, 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 I don't have the solutions. But I think the solution is... Uh, taking actions. As soon as you start asking yourself those questions very seriously, as soon as you start doing, I think you're already producing the solution. Um, so in terms of, 
I think curators and cultural producers uh, will struggle with the current organization of uh, events because galleries, uh, the gallery model is collapsing, the fair model is collapsing, everything is collapsing. So we will have to readjust and none of us knows how to, but we have to produce ideas. We have to produce solutions, even if they are weird, we have to, to make things, so to produce ideas and test them. Uh, and I think curators especially, they have this amazing skill at looking at what artists produce and imagining uh, having a bigger picture. So I think the, the curators will have um, the, the possibility of uh, imagining the futures. So let's say the future maybe is all about uh, uh, renewables or robots or uh, uh, maybe we have to find a new way of working at home or like to uh, you, we have to reinvent everything. So I guess that's what curators uh, do. They sort of put together ideas and they materialize ideas. So we, we have to create ideas. We have to imagine futures. Uh, then I have no idea about the practicalities. Uh, is, that gonna, is this going to be, I don't know, like a mobile exhibition that moves in a bus or... or I had no idea. We have to be very creative uh, on every level um, and we have to think outside the box. Um, but we have to produce futures that are not dystopic, dystopian. Uh, I feel like my work has been very dystopic for many years because I've been very influenced by science fiction and by uh, very sort of dark uh, science fiction films. And now that this science fiction stuff, end of the world shit is happening, we have to have other imaginaries with more positive futures and we need those ideas so we have something to aim for. Uh, so Pedro de Castro is curious if you had encountered any legal problems or on projecting on these infrastructures, if there is some office that support legal, legal help uh, for these actions. So, let's see. Uh, so, I was... The interesting thing when you do uh, direct actions like this uh, is that this is sort of new. I don't think the police... Uh, I, I, I don't think the police is used to see uh, uh, hipsters or like... Uh, uh, people turning up with uh, projectors and lasers and stuff. So people uh, in, in, in charge and the police is actually very surprised and they don't know how to react. I would say that was true in the UK, that was true in Belgium and also in Germany. Uh, and I had no problem whatsoever. Uh, we are lucky enough to have uh, a, a projection that could be turned on and off instantly. So I used to do graffiti and of course graffiti is, uh, is, is another story. Uh, but with light, you're not doing any harm, so uh, I had my equipment taken uh, several times, but uh, I had it back. So I would say legal, if you're lucky enough to be in Europe or in a sort of democratic country, th there's not much legal issues. Uh, and if there were, then uh, I know I can have uh, legal support from uh, NGOs and from uh, other activists. So. And to be honest, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm happy to go to jail for a couple of days or to have a fine because I'm, I'm privileged enough to, to not be very affected by climate change yet compared to uh, the global south. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of ready to, um, to face a legal procedure. Um, what is the legislation of these places? There's none. Uh, no one knows if it's allowed to do a projection on the parliament. Um, uh, you, if you ask a lawyer, you could find an answer or like a gray, but it's a gray area. And, uh, and that, again, I think if we are privileged enough to have a projector uh, and e expensive equipment, I think we should take the risk of uh, facing uh, legal issues. Uh, I mean, I, I, will, I will take this risk. Uh, Personally. So Simon Le Puissant, 
is asking, don't you fear that kind of action will end in an aesthetization of the struggle rather than a concrete progress? In other words, should artists close their laptop and load their guns? Very good question. Um, I think we need a very wide sort of diversity of actions. I don't think everyone should uh, ha be on the same uh, level of, of action. I'm personally against uh, uh, violence, so uh, I, I prefer to do um, uh, non, non violent actions. And I want to bring um, uh, creative actions and sort of positive and cheerful actions. And I'm hoping that these will maybe resonate with some people that will join the, 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 the sort of fight or join the, the causes. Uh, but I think it's very important to have the full spectrum. Uh, I really respect uh, radical activists, um, uh, people like Roger Hallam, one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion. Okay, so he's not a perfect person, he's, he's very radical and he's keen to go to prison and sometimes even his um, uh, speech can be uh, a little bit um, extreme. So I wouldn't agree with him on everything, but I think having such a strong voice is important in in the conversation. And we also need, uh, during the, the London um, uh, rebellion, we also need uh, people making food for the, the rebels. So we had um, uh, moms um, uh, and, and dads uh, that were there around the clock, uh, dads with their children and with their families, they were grannies. So, you know, you don't have to be a young person with a gun to do a re revolution. I think you want to have... Um, as many people as possible and uh, an, an equity of women and men and, and young and old and, uh, and I think yeah there should be radical actions uh, non-violent ideally but they, we also need like very soft uh, actions and people with empathy and kindness uh, and uh, parents and I yeah so but I, I think you're right we Doing a projection, it's not helping much, you know, it's just amplifying a message, but I'm not even as brave as uh, people who are at the front line of the barricade and are being taken away by the, by the police. They are, I think, the real heroes, but I'm, uh, I'm willing to, um, to help. So, yeah, there's a, a risk of aesthetization. That's true. Uh, I had a... a, a, a a problem with the coal mine itself. It's very. I found the coal mine very beautiful, but I think it's as beautiful as it's terrible. And um, I think the, the the aesthetic can be a very strong element. I think it, it will be very. It can be very visually impactful. Aesthetic doesn't mean much. It's just a, a way to convey a message. Um, but I believe uh, aesthetics can be part of the conversation and the and the project too. Nigel Lil is asking, that will annoy a lot of uh, artists as Autodesk software is prevalent at my university. Should people boycott Autodesk? I think Autodesk does great software. I think they, a small part of what they do, or we don't know if it's small because they're not transparent, but a part of what they do um, uh, is with oil companies and gas companies, and we should uh, make sure that they are transparent about their, 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 their act operations. Uh, maybe one way would be to boycott Autodesk, but if we do this, we need a massive boycott. We need not a, a single user or 10 single users would not mm, do much change. So I think we would need, uh, yeah, universities, uh, not even boycotting, but contacting the CEOs and the leaders and asking and like challenging them. I think that would be um, the, the, the strongest thing to do. If the conversation uh, can reach all the executives and the investors um, through users boycott, through universities or through websites or through anything, I think that's what we need to do. We need this topic, the, the, we need the topic of sustainability to be at the core of their practice and not just marketing. At the moment, at Autodesk, sustainability is everywhere, but it's a marketing department. So it means that in one office, you have people selling to oil uh, companies uh, and fracking and gas and tar sands in one office. 
And in the next office, you have the marketing team and they're making PDF and they're flooding their website with like green PR. And these people don't talk because they don't have to. They, they do their job and the CEO gets his $9 million uh, a year to make sure that the sale guy uh, st still sells to oil. So I think we have to discuss about the, the structural problem inside companies and especially inside uh, stock market companies. Um, Autodesk is owned by BlackRock. Uh, at it's, they, they own 8.5% of the shares. And BlackRock is the largest fossil fuels investor in the world. That's the core problem. It's uh, structurally capitalism is, is made to uh, optimize profits for the few people uh, uh, who are running companies, uh, despite the damage it does to the rest of the, of the world. I think that's the, the main problem. Uh, I think that was a long monologue. I'm getting um, uh, my voice. Uh, I have a, a sore throat. So maybe if Juliette tells me if there's a last question or not. So bear with me again. This is the first thing I'm doing this. Uh, it's much more difficult to talk about climate action than it is to talk about light uh, and, and projection and stuff. So I hope um, you will, you had, you learned something maybe, or you got inspired or, or whatever, but feel free to, uh, to reach me uh, via uh, email if you have any more questions. If you're part of a, 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 an activist group, uh, you could get in touch uh, to, to have access to the equipment. If you're not part of an activist group, uh, you should. <laughs> That's my advice. It's actually uh, as soon as you start taking actions and like being with other people and with the community, I think the, you feel you're doing political work. Uh, you are trying to uh, uh, somehow uh, affect uh, politics and, 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 and be part of the, of, of the, the uh, uh, discussions and, and the world. Uh, so that would be my, my advice if you uh, if you care about climate emergency and climate action, uh, get together with other people, with other groups. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to stop now and I hope uh, you had a good time. Juliette, should I, should I stop? Okay, bye everyone. Cheers. Oh. Oh, 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 well, sorry, now I've missed a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to do this real quick in like a minute. Bill Balu Galusha is asking when or how did you make that transition from the past just, just setting life and where your head is at now, working towards climate change, civil disobedience. Uh, so yeah, the, the turning point was discovering the mine and realizing that we're fucked and leaders are not going to save us. And then I completely sort of shifted my perspective on how to deal with clients, how to deal with projects. Um, so yeah, that was, for me, that was the key moment. Also at uh, the Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, protest uh, were also key moments. So I would, um, yeah, for me, that was the, the important point. And uh, another question, okay. Okay, final question to sum up. Is the, is the core of your message that as an in, in, individual, everyone alone can make a difference or that we should all team up to make the revolution a civil one? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's no solution. I think people have been NGOs and People have been struggling for decades to find um, uh, to find solutions. I think the solution doesn't exist yet. I don't. Uh, we have to make up ideas. That would be uh, my uh, conclusion. The ideas that we need to save the world and save the planet, and for like, you know, it's not just uh, climate justice. It's also social justice. It's all kind of injustices in the world. Um, we have to change the system, phase out uh, a capitalistic system into something new. So we have to produce ideas. We have to produce solutions, uh, new narratives. We have to produce imaginaries. Uh, I think technologies can have a very uh, important part. Uh, maybe it's 
yeah, I think there's a, a big space for technology. Uh, um, we have to make up all these these things. So either it's individual, if you feel like you're the next Greta Thunberg, uh, go for it. If you feel like you want to um, uh, uh, help uh, a group like, like Extinction Rebellion, you don't have, have to be arrested. You can be just supporting them uh, by providing um, uh, support, help, pictures, whatever creative you could uh, provide. Uh, yeah, we have to create Imaginaries, I think, um, are the most powerful uh, tool we, we need to produce right now. And I'm going to stop there. Thanks, everyone. See you next time, I guess. Thanks, Juliette.